Alrighty, assalamu alaikum. Okay, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Oh wow, that's a really big font. Okay. Alrighty, well, alhamdulillah, the power's back. So, for those of you who were here last week, we had a we had a concert vibe after the lights went out, but alhamdulillah, we got it going again. Um, we are, uh, inshallah, at the conclusion of Imam al-Ghazali's texts. You know, we, we called this series uh, al-Ghazali's ad- life advices because really that's what it comes down to. I mean, the, the, the specific part of his life is that he's speaking to a student of his, but the reality is that this could be advice for any one of us. And um, he's closing off his advice with, you know, some really, really sage wisdoms that you would really take from any elder. Um, so he, he's, for those of you who weren't here the last couple times, he's finishing off his set of letters that he's writing to his student. And he says that there's eight things in life that you have to be really careful with. Four of them you have to stay away from at all costs. And four of them you have to do as much as you can. So out of the eight, they're split down the middle, four and four. From the four that he said you have to stay away from at all costs in order to live a life of spiritual growth. And again, spirituality, when I use that word, I want everyone to think of all it means is coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your words and in your actions. That's it. It's not something complicated or fancy. When I say spiritual or spirituality, it literally means nearness to Allah. How? By what you do and what you say. That's it. Right? So the four things that Al-Ghazali said that you have to stay away from, number one, he said, is disputing with people. Don't become a person who's argumentative. Don't become combative like that. Okay? Number two is he said, as much as you can, don't become the advice giver. As much as you can. Become the person that holds your tongue. Don't become the one that's always preaching to everybody all the time. Right? Try to hold it in. This doesn't mean that you never give good advice, no. But what it means is that it's very easy to fall into the trap of becoming the person that says a lot but doesn't do a lot. And the best way that you can control that ratio of what you say versus what you do is just limiting what you say until you develop what you do more and more. And then, of course, your actions will speak louder than your words, right? The Prophet his, his his example was his greatest lesson people looking at him and being able to see him and interact with him, he didn't have to spend a lot of time verbally reminding and teaching people. He really didn't. He was just a living example. The third thing that you stay away from, according to Al-Ghazali, is don't become a person that seeks out companionship with, you know, in his time he said like leaders, sultans and government officials. But in our time we can understand this to be don't become a person that aspires to network with the wealthy and the rich and the famous, right? People lose their minds over what? Who's the most famous person that you have in your phone or a picture of someone famous or what was the latest thing? If someone likes your tweet or shares your stuff or whatever, all this stuff for a Muslim is secondary, right? And we mentioned last week that this obsession with celebrity is not really based in anything substantial. You do occasionally have people that are well-known because of the work that they do, right? Because of the contributions that they've made to society. But they're not nearly as popular or as well-known as people who are really just celebrities because of, you know, the sake of their celebrity itself. And so Muslims are people that we don't necessarily look down on people, no, but we're not necessarily going to give props just because somebody, uh, uh, you know, is famous, right? We look at the substance of human beings. And the fourth thing he said to stay away from is don't accept gifts from people in high positions that are trying to get you to compromise your your face, right? These same sultans. Don't be a person that sells out, okay? Don't sell out your religion for a cheap price, okay? The Now we go to the four things that he says that you should do. So the first one that he said, and we covered this, was he said, make your dealings. I'm going to make the text a little bit bigger here. He said, make your dealings with Allah, all of your actions with Allah. Try to frame it in the same way that you would frame how you expect someone to serve you. So if you had a person that's job was to take care of you and the quality of service that you expect in that moment, think to yourself, like, do I give Allah that same kind of quality? 
do I care, right, as much about my responsibility to Allah as I expect someone to care about me, right? If you went over to the counter and you ordered a drink and the person behind there was ignoring you, you say, excuse me, I'd like to get coffee, and they just ignored you, right? Neither of these two would ignore ever, mashallah, but they ignored you. If you went to a place and they, and they didn't even want to take your order, they didn't even care, right? They got your drink wrong, got your name wrong, whatever. You would just be like, what is this place? You would never go back, right? Now imagine, like, how many times in prayer we forget which rakah we're in. <laughs> you know, how, which salah am I praying again? The forgetfulness sets in. So what Ghazali said, this is why I love him, because he's so real. He's like, look, you expect more from people than you expect from yourself with Allah. That's not fair. He's like, be fair. If you, if you hope to have a, 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 a good service from people in life for whatever reason, right? If you ever get disappointed, then just think to yourself, man, how many times have I disappointed Allah with my lack of good service? My inability to be punctual with Allah. That I can't focus. You know, if anyone's ever started looking at their phone while you were talking to them, you got disappointed. Think about how many times in prayer you lost khushu'a. Just translate everything back to that. It doesn't mean that people should treat you poorly. That's not what I'm saying. But this is Al-Ghazali's way of trying to what? Make us introspective. You, you can't demand that people put you on a high pedestal and respect and this and this when, when you struggle yourself, right? We're all human. And so he says, whatever you would not expect from your servant, in a metaphorical sense, do not accept for Allah on your behalf, who is much greater than you. Second, he said, this is the new one. He said, treat everybody, treat every single person as though you would want to be treated by them. This is the golden rule. Al-Ghazali lived a thousand years ago, right? Or not a thousand years ago, roughly, right? But 900 so years ago. And he's saying the golden rule. This is on posters in elementary schools across the country, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Do unto others the way that you wish to be done to yourself. Like whatever you do to people is what's going to happen to you. This is a, a, a Islamic principle. It's a prophetic principle. In fact, one could argue that in Islam, we're actually taught to treat others better than we expect to be treated. Right? We're taught to do that. I don't know how many of y'all like grew up and, um, you know, your mom or dad was like big about cooking food for the neighbors. Anybody? Like my mom would cook like really, really good food and we'd be excited. And then we'd see another pot of like mediocre food next to it. And we're like, oh God, which one? And the kufta and the kebab, that was for our neighbor, Mr. Richardson. The rice and the beans were for us. Because she had five children, so she's like, we're not having kufta and kebab on a Tuesday, right? That's for, but again, why, why did she do that? It's not because she wanted her kids to feel, you know, clearly we, did, we were not malnourished, alhamdulillah, clearly. But, you know, the reality is, alhamdulillah, but the reality is that from the Muslim tradition, right, we are taught to outdo what is done to us. We're, that's how we're taught. And let alone ever fall short of what's being done to us. That's not an option. It should almost feel like if you match somebody, you barely passed. You got like a C minus, right? I know I just gave a lot of people, it triggered a lot of you, right? But our goal as Muslims is to try to do more for the person than they did for us. The Prophet ﷺ did this numerous times, countless times. And if you wonder why people were so quick to accept his message, why he was so magnetic, why he was so beautiful, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in character and in, and in physical beauty and in dealings, this is one of the traits that he mastered, which is what? I'm always going to make sure that whoever deals with me cannot complain about me. That's like my promise. They may not, they may not be happy all the time, but I want to make sure that they can't complain about me. Right? So, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would over overpay for things that weren't worth what he was paying right you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran he talks about the one who bargains past what is what is normal the one who pushes past you know like when you're making a deal I know like a lot of Muslims take a lot of pride in this I made the car salesman cry today 
you know? I broke him or her down. Like, I made them feel they wanted to quit their job. And they're like, all about the deal, okay? Not calling the Maimons out, but I'm calling you out. I'm all about the deal. You know, like, Muslims don't try to break salespeople, right? We try to, like, we get a fair price, but we don't try to go beyond and leverage their need for the sale. There's a, there's a certain kind of exploitation that even though they're selling it, you know that you push them too far. And maybe they need it, and so they're selling it for whatever they can get, but they know that it's, it's not going to be good for them, right? And this is something that as Muslims we have to be cautious of. I'm not saying that every salesperson is a charity case, but what I'm saying is we always live with a, a level of awareness that's beyond just materialism. Like when you buy something, you're not just buying something. When you purchase something, there's a, there's a spiritual transaction happening. I want to make sure that I'm not breaking this person, right? This is why you travel to the Muslim world and you'll see they will always try, once you've made the deal, they'll always try to give you something to make sure that you know that I'm not cheating you, right? That I'm not cheating you. And this is something we have to be very, very careful of. Unfortunately, you know, the reality is that we have a lot of work to do with our reputation in America, especially. We have a lot of work. My dad converted to Islam based off of his interactions with people in the Middle East. And he didn't have a negative experience with Islam until he came back to America where he was born and raised. He didn't have a negative experience with Muslims until he came back to America. He was in Riyadh, all good. He was in Cairo, no problem. He was in Lebanon, perfect. He loved it. He was like, came back to America and walked into a masjid, and that's where he had issues. So we really have to reflect internally and not, now I know a lot of us, you know, we, we also can empathize with that, but we can't perpetuate these bad, these issues, these treatments, right, of people. I, there was a brother that told me, like, can you give a khutbah about tipping at restaurants? Can you give a khutbah about tipping? And I do agree, tipping has kind of gotten out of control. On your way out, if you would just not mind filling out the iPad, you know. <laughs> Could you just, you know. Finish out the iPad, please. It's gotten out of control a little bit, right? Okay? But there's a couple things that we can think about. Number one, this brother asked, can you go khutbah on tipping? I said, why? He goes, I work at a restaurant, and whenever anyone walks in, and they're like visibly Muslim, all the waiters hide. Because it's next up, right? The waiter or the waitress, they get next up. And when it's a Muslim, like if it's like a Muslim woman in hijab, it's like obvious that it's a Muslim family. Or it's like a, a, a Muslim family, it looks very obvious that they're Muslim, it's after Jummah or something. All the waiters and waitresses run away. Because they know that they're not going to get tipped. I don't want to wait, I don't want to take care of that family. Can you imagine? The most generous person in the history of humanity, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is being represented by people that scare service workers. When they meet him, what are they going to say? He was the most generous. And it, the people that claim to follow him can't tip $3 more? It's bizarre. So there's a, the, the, what Ghazali is saying here is very important, right? Treat others the way that you want to be treated. It's a very simple rule. If you expect people to take care of you, take care of them. Only treat people the way which you are okay reciprocating that treatment. Right? So this is a, a, a big point for us. Even simple things. How do we leave places? I once one time, wallahi, this, is, this story breaks my heart. 30 and up is not supposed to be uh, getting yelled at, by the way, but it's okay. I, I went to a, I was at a Muslim event, a weekend event at a college campus where they host, you know, like classes and stuff, Islamic weekend classes, and I walked into the bathroom when it was time to pray and everyone made wudu. How do you think that bathroom looked? Like chaos, chaos. And I walked in there because I was teaching the class. So I, I finished teaching and I was answering questions and then I had to go make wudu. So I went to go make wudu and everyone had already left and the janitor was there. And the janitor just looked defeated. And wallahi, I swear by Allah, you know what he said? I'll never forget this, it was 15 years ago. You know what he said? He goes, I never want to be Muslim. And he saw me and he said, I'm sorry. Because he, he looked over, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I said, no. 
And I rolled up my sleeves. And again, I'm not, bra- I'm not bragging, but I was like 20. I rolled up my sleeves. I started cleaning. The person said, because there's water all over this, I don't want to be Muslim. Who wants to be like this? The Prophet ﷺ has a hadith that says that cleanliness is half of faith. See, the problem is not Islam. It's just the way that we live it. Or the way that we don't live it, I should say. And so Al-Ghazali here is saying, look, Muslims have become very good at complaining. We have. Right? If someone gets kicked off a plane and their name is Abdurrahman, call care, let's do it. Right? We're going to sue American Airlines for everything they got. Islamophobia, we're good at that. We mobilize quickly. Hashtags are out. People are getting you know, free airline tickets. CEOs of companies are apologizing. Muslims are just like tightening the screws. Keep going, keep going. Do I think that Muslims should defend their rights? Absolutely. But man, do we have a little bit of work to do on ourselves? Yes or no? And so we, we can maybe slow down the complaining a little bit and just work on creating better habits that take care of people so that maybe when things that happen to us, what if we live in a world where if something happened to a Muslim, it wouldn't have to be only Muslim voices getting upset. But it would be people that said, hey, you know what? I work with Ahmed, and he is like the friendliest, most generous. What if all the waiters were like, they are the most generous tippers in the world. We're going to take care of them. What if all the janitors got united and said, every Muslim I've met has left this bathroom spotless. What if, what if everybody that was supposed to take care of people was able to testify for us on the Day of Judgment. That, oh Allah, we were never wronged by a Muslim. Right? Ask Allah to to help us. And it starts with everybody. It starts here, with you. What culture do you have with yourself, with your spouse, with your kids? Right? Treat your, tell your kids, train your children to respect people who work in the service industry. They're not to be disrespected because they're not a doctor or engineer, no. Tell your kids, give cash, tip them, train, that's tarbiyah, right? To understand, thank them. You see, Musa, you see that, that, that lady who's cleaning? Go and say thank you. She cleaned this whole place, go and say thank you. You'll see my son, six years old, walks over like an awkward 11-year-old kid, he's a giant. And he's thanking, because why? Because I'm like, look, I'm not going to let this kid grow up being like, it's her job to clean. No, it's not. She is doing us a favor. We are paying her. But really, she is doing us an immense favor by keeping this building clean. Go and thank her. Right? And that's okay. It's okay to let the Muslims take that and understand that. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ was so beloved because of the way he treated people. So beloved. In all your dealings with people, treat them as you would be pleased to be treated by them. Because the iman of a worshiper is incomplete until he loves for all other people what he loves for himself. That you will never believe. A person will never believe until they love for their brother or sister what they love for themselves. Imam al nawawi says that here, brother or sister, ummah, can mean humanity. It doesn't have to mean just the Muslim community, but it can mean everybody. Right? So let's become this. And everybody, I want everyone to adopt this principle, okay? Everybody wants to be treated the same as everybody else, right? But I want you to understand something. As a Muslim, Allah has promised you Jannah. Say Alhamdulillah. You've been promised paradise. I didn't hear enough Alhamdulillahs for that. As a Muslim, you've been promised paradise, okay? What does that mean? That means that anything that I have to do as a person that receives that promise, I'll do it because it's worth it. And so if we look around and we see, you know, he didn't hold the door open. Why do I have to hold the door open? You know, she didn't do this. Why do I have to do this? She didn't put it after she tried her clothes on. She didn't put it back. Why do I have to put it back? Just because I'm Muslim? My answer is yes, just because you're Muslim. Because maybe that person doesn't have that moral awareness that you have. They don't follow someone named Muhammad So they don't have somebody they have to live up to in that way. Their morality 
is on them. Our morality is tied to an entire ummah that is claiming to follow this one person, Aisha And so a resounding yes, if you are Muslim, the stakes are higher. The standards are higher. If you are Muslim, absolutely. Don't compare yourself to people who are not. It's just a reality. Compare yourself to the Prophet Sallallahu not somebody else. Because why? Because Jannah is not cheap. And that's, that's, that's how we have to adopt ourselves, inshallah. You know, the, the, the entire, how many viewers are from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka? Okay. Do you know where the first Muslims from the Southeast Asian subcontinent converted from? Tradespeople, tradespeople who came, some say from Yemen, some say the entire Arabian subcontinent, and they converted an entire subcontinent of people, India, Pakistan, right, Pakistan, of course, I don't want to get into the history of it, right? Let's just say India, let's just say Indian area, let's just say, oh God, I'm stuck, all right. I'm just going to go Bangladesh, the area of Bangladesh, there you go, right? All converted based off of what? Were these scholars who traveled there? Were they making dawah? Was it Tablighi Jamaat? They showed up. Assalamu alaikum brothers. Please come to the masjid. I'll give you a short talk. <laughs> no, it was not Tablighi Jamaat. Were they scholars? No. Did they quote Quran and Hadith? No. Why did they convert? Who knows? What's the story? What's the history? They were businessmen. They were tradespeople. And they came and they dealt with them justly and honestly and they didn't cheat them and the story goes the narrations say that the people there were so affected by that because trade why is why why is the hadith say that the the marketplace is one of the most hated places of allah because it's a it's a breeding ground for for cheating it's a it's a very slippery slope so they arrive and they deal with them honestly and people start saying like yeah, 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 I'll buy it, whatever it is. But why are you being so nice? Why are you treating me this way? Why are you not trying to steal or cheat or whatever? And they say, in my faith, this is what, this is what we're taught. Which, by the way, master that line. Whenever you do something good and someone comments on it or like recognize, master that line. It doesn't, you don't have to say in Sahih Bukhari in the chapter. <laughs> they'll be like, what? You just, all, it's one line. You know, in my faith, we're taught to do this. In my faith, we're taught to do this, right? In Islam, our Prophet Muhammad taught us to do this. That's it, right? Just leave them with that. You know, if you believe Islam is true, if you believe the Quran is true and the Prophet ﷺ was a true prophet, I'm telling you, you don't have to put Islam in people's hearts. You just put it right in front of their eyes and right in their ears and let it do its work. Let it do its work. You don't have to shove it down their throat into their chest. Just put it right there and right there and just walk away. It's magical. It's magical, subhanAllah. And just master that line. You know, yeah, the reason I do this is because in my religion we're taught to be clean. So I'll take care of that. We're taught to take care of those who take care of us. So don't worry, it's on me. Here's a high tip. Right? The people that have the, the, cult, the, 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 the honor of, of you know, being known as the, be the most generous people, you see like these... these uh, receipts online from like athletes and celebrities who tip well i wish man i wish there come a time where muslims are known as the most generous people and alhamdulillah i will say it's it's getting better there's some growth right i you know there's some there's some places where muslims are known for being very generous i will say that the easiest thing to do is just bring food bring food during my, my ACL recovery in my rehab center, I brought a box of croissants, chocolate croissants. And, um, you know, I'm trying to lose weight. And so I was trying to get them to gain weight so that I would, could feel better about myself when I walked in every time because they're all like really in shape. So I brought chocolate croissants. And there was a few weeks ago. It was like eight. It was like maybe two months ago. And uh, yesterday... I was, I was at my physical therapy and I was doing like workouts. I was sweating. It was gross. I was huffing and puffing. You know, the Cowboys need a tight end apparently, so I'm just getting ready just in case they call or a, or a quarterback at this point. But the Bears do too, so I can't talk. So, and I'm walking down and this girl runs up to me, one of the staff there. She goes, hey. I go, hey. 
and I'm like, hey, right? And I was like, I'm working out. I'm trying to let, let her know you're not the reason I'm out of breath. Like, I'm happily married. So then she goes, are you the croissant guy? And I go, yeah, I guess. I was like, that's kind of offensive and triggering. I'm trying to lose weight, but sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm a croissant guy. And she goes, can you bring, can I ask you shamelessly like to bring some because tomorrow or Thursday is my last day. And so I said, absolutely. I picked up my phone and I, the bakery we order from, I just ordered some more and I'm going to take it to them. And then today she's like, you know, you brought the, you're going to bring the croissants, right? I said, yeah, you all know tomorrow what I'm going to say, right? What am I going to say when I bring it? Oh my God, thank you so much. I'll say in my religion. Well, Lahi, I'm going to say it. In my fa- Look, if I do something nice for you, you owe me 10 seconds. I don't want money. I don't want anything else. But I can at least tell you that my prophet, whenever people asked him for something, he would do it. That's my prophet. And so you come and ask me for something. If I can do it, I'm going to do it. If I can get you ch- chocolate croissants. And if that's the one thing she knows about Muslims is that they gave me chocolate croissants. That's a win. That's a huge win. Right? All jokes aside, food is magical, subhanAllah. So, so he said, treat them as you'd be pleased to be treated by them for the iman of a worshiper is incomplete until they love for all people that which they love for themselves. Third, if you read or pursue knowledge, then your knowledge should reform your heart and purify your soul. He says, yambaghi an yakuna ilmuka it has to yuslih from islah it has to make right islah means to take something that is dead broken and to repair it to make it good again so if anyone here ever tried to like plant something and it wasn't going well and then somehow you were able to bring that plant back that's islah that's what's happening in the heart of every person when they read when they study when they learn that's the process that's why these halaqat are meant to be a little bit uncomfortable. It's not a place where we're going to come and just talk about how amazing we are. We're going to talk about how amazing we can be. And part of that is that when you see the delta between where you are and where you could be, there should be a little pinch, right? But that pinch is a motivation. We celebrate the wins, but we also look at where we could get better. It's a constant seesaw between gratitude and being patient. Grateful to Allah for what he's given us and working on ourselves patiently. Always. Back and forth, back and forth. So he says, it should reform your heart and purify your soul. Just as if you discovered that you had one week to live. Every time you open the Quran, every time you open up the the, the narrations of the Prophet ﷺ, anytime you go to a halaqah, imagine, right? Why did the Prophet ﷺ, when he lined up for prayer, before every prayer he would say what? Like pray it as if it's your, the last prayer. Pray this as if it's your final prayer. And I know that that sounds a little bit dramatic, but how many people prayed it and it was their last prayer? Right? So just because we've come week after week and we pray and we get new day after new day, alhamdulillah, the reality is we still have to prepare ourselves that this could be the last moment that I have. Right? These few nights. This week, this month, this year, etc. So how am I going to appear before Allah? I don't want to show up and Allah is like, look, you, you, you kept going to all the classes and you kept reading all the books and watching all the YouTube videos. Like, but you're the same person. Not one bit of you changed. Right? So he says, just as if you discovered you had one week to live, what would you occupy yourself doing? You would, of course, not occupy yourself studying all the sciences of jurisprudence. Is Bitcoin halal? Right? Is this this? I remember I told the story today in class. I was teaching a year or two. And my mom, when we were younger, you know, in high school, we would like just debate like the dumbest things about Islam. You know, is the Dajjal really the TV? <laughs> See, this is the generation that gets those jokes, okay? Right? Like, which ones, how many of the signs of the Day of Judgment are here? And the irony is like we're missing Isha in the masjid as we're debating this in cars, in parking lots. Like, so I would go home and my mom would be like, what did you talk about? What did you and your friends talk about? And I would say, 
you know, this or that, this or that, you know, just whatever, just random stuff, man. And she would say, oh, that's, we that's interesting. I'd say, why? She goes, I didn't realize that those were going to be on the test that the angels in the grave are going to come with. And I'd say, what? And she said, what three questions are they going to ask you about? Who is your Lord? Who is your prophet? What book did he come with? And he said, my mom said, just worry about those. Just worry about those. Now, yes, people have questions. Is this permissible? Is that? But if the, if, if the exploration of fiqh is taking up 97% of your life, your Islamic intellect, and you have 3% dedicated for tafsir of Quran and sirah of the Prophet ﷺ learning his life, there is a huge issue there, right? We can figure out the permissibility of all that stuff in like 5%. But 95% of who you are, 95% of who, what makes you up who you are, has to be the book of Allah and his messenger. You know why? You can't claim that you run out. I, you know, I open up, I open up the, this tafsir that I'm reading when I prepare for heart work, and I literally sit there in the room and I'm reading, and I'm like, how am I going to fit all this in? How am I going to explain all this? There's no way. And then that's only one book. How many, how many tafsirs are there? Like 30, 40, 50 that I can access on my app. And subhanAllah, I'm just sitting and I'm like, there is more knowledge than a person can conceivably spend their entire life gaining to get close to Allah and we're wondering about Bitcoin. And then we're like, why is my prayer hitting? Why is my Isha so distracted? How's Ethereum doing? You know, like it's just, it's all really tied together. But I guarantee you, the more you learn about the Quran and the life of the Prophet Sallallahu the more you're constantly going to be in the state of reverence of Allah and that will help every act of worship, every single thing that you and I do. So he says, you would not think about jurisprudence. You would not be debating these big issues of morality. You would not be debating all of the principles of legal uh, uh, schools, scholastic theology, all these questions, right? Because you would know that these disciplines are not going to help you. You would rather engage yourself in monitoring the state of your heart. Who am I? What have I become? And apprehending the characteristics of your soul, you would start to look at yourself. How can I become better? Was I rude to somebody today? Did I yell at someone? Did I call my parents? Did, I, did someone leave this day feeling hurt because of me? Did I, did I pray to Allah today? Did I thank him for everything he gave me today? Shunning your attachment to the world. Would you care if they had brown or black in stock? If you had a week to live? Would that matter? Right? Would, you, would, would, would everything, would we be so focused on the minutia of acquiring new things that they just like, it like caused us, how many of us have lost sleep because of like material things? And then you get it and after three weeks you're like, just on to the next new thing. Purifying your soul from all the blameworthy characteristics, occupying yourself with the love and the worship of Allah, and adopting the praiseworthy characteristics. No day or night passes upon a servant in which their death may not take place. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, subhanAllah. It's very, you know, the Prophet ﷺ would say that sleep is the, is the minor death. And so one of my teachers, <laughs> he used to say that the most important dua you can make is, Alhamdulillah, when you wake up in the morning, you say, all praise be given to the one who gave us life after he caused us death. And you, you wonder about the people on the Day of Judgment, their greatest emotion on the Day of Judgment is going to be regret. It's not going to be... The greatest emotion in the Qur'an of the people on the Day of Judgment is regret. It's not frustration. It's not anger. It's not even sadness. It's regret. Ya hasrata. They're going to say, oh, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I did this. And what's the one request? Oh, Allah, just give me one day. Send me back for 24 hours. I will live it perfectly. And Allah will say, you just came from there. You're asking to go back, but you had, forget one day. You had decades. 
and you just came from there. Allah make it easy. So this is Imam Ghazali trying to get real. Remember, this is the end of a lot of advice. So if this is your first 30 and up, welcome. <laughs> it's heavy. But he is, he is wrapping up a lot of advice to his student. He says, fourth, and all these things are tied together, do not accumulate of this world more than what can take care of you for one year. As the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would pray to Allah and he would make dua. He would say, O oh Allah, make the provision of the family of Muhammad وسلم, sufficient. His dua, he would rarely ask for more except that he would only ask for more contentment. That's what he wanted. Because Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knew that if, if you get started by asking for more things, the end is very out of your control. But if you ask for more contentment, you'll actually feel like you have too much. When you have contentment, you feel like I have enough. And in fact, you feel like, you know what? I don't need any more. I don't need any more. But if you constantly surround yourself with visuals and you know, audio experiences and just life of people getting more, having more, you're never going to run out. The Prophet Sallallahu said that the heart and the soul of the son and daughter of Adam, nothing stops its desires except for dirt. Dirt here meaning your grave. As long as you're alive, you're always going to want something. Wallahi, this is true. Right? It's the way, it's, and, and this is a struggle that we have. Instead of trying to get more, try to get more contentment and see what that, see what that does. You know, I'll be sitting with somebody who has the means to buy something and they could get it and it won't even make a dent. And you ask them, you say, hey, why don't you just upgrade? Right, this is not a shot being fired at the iPhone 15 owners, right? Why don't you just upgrade? You could afford it. It won't be a problem for you. And you know what they say? I love it. They say, this one works just fine. That line is like one of the most spiritually strong lines ever. This one's fine. I don't need this. You know, what are those stories you see? NFL quarterback drives the same truck he's driven through college. Why do, why do they publish these stories? Because contentment is so rare. It's rare that somebody who gets a lot doesn't just go crazy. But this is who the Prophet Sallallahu was. This is what he taught us to be. And so he would pray for his own family. Oh Allah, make whatever we have enough for us. Never test us. Oh Allah, never test us. La taj'al dunya akbar hammina. Don't make the dunya our greatest desire. Don't test me like that. Can you imagine being somebody that gets everything imaginable and you still don't feel happy? That exists. Think of your own progress professionally and financially. Think of it. When were you the happiest? You were the happiest when you had much less. Right? You, you made a fraction of what you make now. And you were like, but you were happy. But the more you get, as Sheikh Biggie said, Right? More money, more problems. There are some scholars, by the way, I'll be reading their, their works and they're talking about hubba dunya and they literally wrote, you know, more money, more problems in Arabic, <laughs> you know? It's like, kathir al-amwal, akthar al-ishkal. Like, you know, the more money you have, the more problems you have. al <laughs> takathur Allah says in the Quran, like you are so just driven in this deluded sense by what? A takathur. Get more, get more, get more. Hatta zurtum al maqabir. Until it's going to drive you right into the ground when you die. Kalla ta'lamun. Thumma kalla ta'lamun. Sofa ta'lamun. Thumma kalla sofa ta'lamun. Says, when are you going to know? When are you going to understand? 
So the reality is that contentment, pleasure with what we have, is like its own fortune. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said what? Al-ghina, ghina nafs Ghina, true wealth, is the needlessness of the soul. And by the same token, we understand from that hadith that al-faqr, right? Poverty is what? Fakhrun nafs is when your soul is constantly in need. So Imam Ghazali finishes this beautiful set of letters by saying that if you can master being content with Allah, you will become the wealthiest person you know. Bank accounts will become irrelevant because there are many who have a lot, but they are not happy. And there are many who have very little and they're so happy. Be from the ones who are happy with Allah no matter what you have. In fact, he used to prepare it for only for her whom he knew had a weakness in her heart. So out of his wives, he would, he, would only, he would set aside more for the ones that he knew, like needed a little bit more. As for the ladies of Yaqeen, meaning the people in his family who had Yaqeen, like stronger faith, he would not accumulate more provision than a day and a half. <laughs> Nothing in the fridge. Just baking soda. And ketchup. You know what I mean? Just, what are we going to eat? We'll figure it out. Now again, the Prophet ﷺ did not command this. So I don't want everyone to go outside and throw out their groceries. I'm going to be a lady of yaqeen tonight, right? Sheikh Omar Suleiman's like, what? That's a new thing? No, okay. But it is important for us to adopt this mentality. Right? You know when you figure out, by the way, you know when you figure out really when you have too much stuff? When you move. When you move, you're like, I haven't opened this box since I moved last time. I'm giving you a fatwa tonight. And I'm not a mufti, but I'm confident. If you have a box in your life, and you look at that box, and you don't know what's inside that box, and it's been years since you've touched that box, I'm asking you, like Bernie, once again, to take that box and put it on the curb. And watch your heart become free from the disease of materials. Watch it. Give stuff away. Get rid of stuff you don't need. Right? As Sheikh Marie Kondo said, if it doesn't spark joy, get rid of it. Okay? Imam Ghazali was way before all these people. They're just ripping. They're just biting off of him. Rahimahullah. We'll conclude there, inshallah. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow us to be able to inculcate these beautiful characteristics within us, that we become people who are content with what we have, that we become people that treat others better than we treat ourselves, and that we treat Allah in a way that is befitting of Him to the best of our ability. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Jazakumullah khairan. On your way out, uh, speaking of being content, giving charity is one of the great ways to break the nafs from attachment to, to, to money. There is a Islamic relief table uh, helping the victims primarily of Libya and Morocco. We all know that the last two weeks have been very, very difficult uh, with earthquakes and floods. SubhanAllah, Allah has tested them in a way he has not tested us. And so I want to ask everybody that don't walk by without giving something. Even if it's $5, look, you know, the, the reality is the Prophet ﷺ said, that save yourself, even if it's half a day. You're not going to be asked about how much you gave. You're going to be asked about if you gave. So just give, right? Don't think that any amount is too little. Just give something, inshallah. And who knows what kind of aid and relief you'll be giving to people that are desperately in need of it, more so than I think any of us could realize. We ask Allah Ta'ala to accept, and we'll see you, inshallah, next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.